Good morning and happy Sabbath. Good morning. Good morning. So you heard, I mean, talking about those that are not uh, usually coming here, that the pastor is rushing today, and they might think, oh, pastor is going home because he wants to stay home more. No, I'm going to preach to fight him, so that's the reason I'm in a rush the fourth Sabbath, that's always. And uh, I'm grateful for the church here in Arden that understands that, and I'm grateful for the church in Paido that are waiting, sometimes a little bit longer, depends on traffic. Uh, is, is it working now? Yeah. Okay, then I, tell me if it's okay, it's working, I can't hear now. Uh, I usually have a good hearing, but sometimes. <laughs> Um, have you seen the sign this morning? I came to church when I, I was pulling into the parking lot and Pastor Serban is going into the battle. I mean, not is, but Pastor Serban going into the battle. I was like, okay, what message are we sending to the community? It's a good message, though, uh, because I'm not starting a fight here. That's not my goal. And I'm not starting a fight with the neighbors. No, that's not our goal. Our goal is to understand the mission that God has for us. And um, I, was, I was, you know, reflecting on what message to bring this morning. And God impressed me about this passage in 1 Samuel when John, Jonathan is going into the battle. Uh, not his father, which is the king. And I was like, okay, let's, let's do this. Let's see what God want to tell us through this message. But first of all, I would like to tell you a story about John Wycliffe. Have you heard about him? Do you know some stories? I think even the great controversy says something about it, right? So he lived 200 years before, or about 200 years before the Reformation. Reformation was 1500s, he was, he died, I think, 13 something, I don't, I'm not that good with, name, with names and, uh, and numbers. So he, you know, the, the, the Protestant Reformation was kind of trying to, not kind of, this is the main purpose, to rediscover, rediscover the Bible, right? Because before, the, whatever the church is saying, it's holy, and nobody can, nobody can address it, and nobody can say anything about. But the Reformation was bringing the Bible as the main source of, uh, the main authority, and everything the Bible says is holy, and you cannot argue with the Bible, not with the church, as it was before. So, Wycliffe came while pastoring the, the church in Lutherworth, England. He came to the request of the Church of Rome to send more money. You know, that was the, that was the issue all the time. And he advised the Church of England and the leaders, the king, he advised not to send any money. That was not sitting well with Rome, right? They needed the money, and not only that they needed the money, but that was a sign that they are not respecting the authority of the Pope, right? So the Pope came out with five bulls, or what is known today as indictments, right? Against Wycliffe. So Wycliffe took the bulls by the horn, and he fought with it, right? And Wycliffe said, I am ready to defend my convictions even unto death. I followed the sacred scriptures. So his authority, authority for him is the scripture, not a person in Rome. But what do you think? That didn't sit well with Rome, right? Because, but because Wycliffe was so popular in England, they placed him to house arrest. Which is, you know, better than being crucified publicly or right, right? So, now Wycliffe has another opportunity, right? While he was at ho in house arrest, he started to write... Again, some doctrines that Rome was, 
were promoting. And one of the doctrines is the doctrine, I don't know if I can pronounce it, but I'll try, the doctrine of transubstantiation, right? It's difficult even in Romanian. It's the same word in Romanian because it's coming from Latin. You know that doctrine? That doctrine believes that when we gather for, we don't believe that. This is what the Catholics are saying, okay? When we gather for the, for the um, communion, the bread and the wine, the bread are, is becoming the, the body of Christ, the flesh of Christ, and the, the, the wine becomes the, the blood. And you literally drink and eat the blood. And, uh, yeah, so uh, he started to write against that and against the indulgences. You know what are those, right? You buy your right to heaven. You buy your right into heaven. So, you see, what, what I'm trying to say is with, about from the life of Wycliffe, we learn that he is getting the opportunity that God is presenting towards him, and he is doing something for the cause of God, right? And believe me, those times that they were living... They don't have freedom of the expression. Today, we can say anything to anyone, and nobody will going to punish us, right? I'm not saying that it's right to do that, but we can. And sometimes, sometimes we take that liberty without thinking very well. But that's not the point today. Today's message is centered on King Saul's son, Jonathan, and his fate journey when he picked a fight with the Philistines. God, God wanted to deliver the Philistines into the hands of the people of Israel. Actually, God put them at their doorstep and they were saying, just go, just take it, just seize this opportunity, just do it, right? But looks like people of Israel were not ready, at least the leader, the supreme leader, which was Saul, the king Saul, which they elected. He was not elected by God. God allowed it, but they said, let's have a king, right? So while, while Jonathan is fighting, what is Saul doing? He is staying under a pomegranate tree. I don't know how much. Have you seen one of those trees? Are they bringing too much comfort? Like a lot of leaves and, you know, shade and, oh, the juice or the fruit. I'm not, I'm not complaining about that. But I'm talking about, you know, I, I mean, I would see I'm going under an oak tree. That provides a lot of shade. It's covering, you know, right? Even if you, are, if you are under an oak tree, even if it's raining... It's not touching you that much because the leaves and the way it's built. But the pomegranate tree, probably the juice, right? Nothing else, not the shade. But, you know, Saul is sitting there and Jonathan is like, what should I do? What should I do? Lord, what should I do? So we see in the story of Jonathan, and then we'll, we'll go immediately to the Bible, right? We see in the story of Jonathan how determined he is for the cause of God. For, I mean, you think that he was a feisty kid that he liked to go to the battle, and that was the only reason that he uh, took such an adventurous journey with his uh, armor bearer, only the two of them going to the battle? Do you think that that was... His motivation or the motivation was something internally that he was convinced that, that he can do something for the Lord. And let me tell you the conditions. There is a Bible verse in to the Bible. If First Kings 14, if I'm not mistaken, towards the end of the chapter, the Bible, Romanian Bible is on the right side. That's the way I memorize Bible. And it says, in the whole army of Israel, only Saul and his son Jonathan has swords. Look for that verse. Swords in Israel. And you'll see, only two persons were armed. 
And they have, Saul has 600 people with him under the pomegranate tree. I don't know how they, I, I probably only him is fitting there, right? He was tall, right? You remember that. Saul was the, high, the tallest man in Israel at that time. That was probably the reason they picked him. Um, so he, they are 600 people, they are sitting there ready to fight. But how you, would you fight if you don't have a weapon? While the Philistines are armed to the teeth. And I think they were the son of men. They were smart. Because they took all the manufacturing and the knowledge of working the iron. So this is how they are building their chariots. And this is how they are building their weapons. Because they know how to do it. In the people of Israel, there is not such a business. They were shepherds and they were something else. I'm not saying that it's wrong. I'm saying, I'm just telling you that this is the moment when they need to fight. And one of them are armed to the fifth. And the others have only two swords. And one of them is sitting under, resting under a pomegranate tree. And the other one is ready to fight. Now, looking at us here on the mountain, right? We are very few. Today we are blessed with so many friends coming to visit us. We, I, we wish you make it more regularly. Praise the Lord for your presence today. But how many we feel like we are here? Oh, in the books, 110 or 112. Uh, we added 416, right? That's a lot of army, right? But in reality, when we are 10 or 15 on a Sabbath day, we feel like we have no weapons. Right? And we, we feel discouraged. But there are two attitudes. One is Saul attitude. He was armed, right? And the other one is Jonathan attitude. He was armed too. I mean, they cannot complain that they, they don't have the weapons. Right? They, they were equally equipped. We don't know the height of, uh, of Jonathan. We know the height of Saul, and that might give him an advantage, right? Because being muscular and strong, it might give you an advantage on a battlefield, right? And we see two attitudes. One, the same equipment. One is like, oh, okay, the Philistines are here. Probably we can take them. But let's sit here. And the other one is like, yeah, I have the weapon. I'll do it. What I'm trying to say is that sometimes we are settling for a fate that makes us look good. But it doesn't do anything for the kingdom of God. We are settling for a faith that makes us look good, right? We are coming to church. Praise the Lord. I'm thankful for everyone. Don't, please, don't, don't take me wrong on this. I'm thankful when I see you here. We are participating in our Sabbath activities. It makes us look good, right? Good Christians. We are seeing each other and I say, wow, how faithful it is, is that person. Praise the Lord for that. But we need to look over. And we need to look to see who is missing for he from here. And in, in, in order, I'm not talking only the members in the books, we need to do that too. But we need to look who is missing and we have a whole community that is missing here. I don't want to give you a guilt trip as Derek said during Sabbath school here. Because people are responding to the gospel, people are responding to the call of God, and sometimes they don't. But what I'm trying to say is to give us, a, to give us an encouragement to do whatever we can with the equipment that we have from God, because we are equipped by God to go into the ministry, to go into the battle. Um, Instead of settling for a faith that makes us look good, we need to look to do 
something good for the kingdom. And as uh, Lee mentioned that Bible, actually was in our Bible study, but Lee brought it up, verse 10 from uh, Ephesians chapter 2. God prepared a good work. We just need to follow. I mean, what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, we need to, we need to come to the point that to love the people around us as much as we love ourselves. Isn't that the command of God? Because if I'm not missing them in here, I won't miss them in the kingdom. But Jesus' heart is different than my heart because he misses everyone that is not present to the call of salvation. He misses and he suffers for everyone, even for those that are turning their back on him. He still suffers. I'm telling how I am. I don't know about you. But sometimes I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm doing my best. I'm trying. But at one point I say, okay, I need to move on. I need to move to another person. And I leave that person back. And I'm like, when somebody is bringing up that person, I'm like, yeah, I tried. I did a lot for him. But and somehow with a little bit of resentment, right? He's not responding. If Jesus would do that to me, I, I won't be alive because I do not deserve to live according with who I am. I live by the grace of God and by what He makes me to be. One day, Jonathan, son of Saul, we won't finish this today, but at least we get started. One day, Jonathan, son of Saul, said to his young armor bearer, Come, let's go over to the Philistine outpost on the other side. But he did not tell his father. Saul was staying on the outskirts of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree in Migran, or Migran, with him about 600 men, among whom was Ahijai, who was wearing an ephod. So the priest was there, right? He was the son of Avicabod's brother Ahitub, son of Phineas, the son of Eli, the Lord's priest of si- in Silo. No one was aware that Jonathan had left. So when, when, when Samuel is writing this, he's presenting the entire religious authority that was there, right? He was there, right? They wanted to say, hey, he was there. That man, Ahijah, I, I don't know how you pronounce it. That was the, there to make sure that the presence of God is there and God can answer, right? That was the only reason he was there. Otherwise, why would priests go to, to battle, right? On each side of the pass that Jonathan intended to cross to reach the Philistine outpost was a cliff. One was called both that way and the other the other way. One cliff stood to the north towards Michmash, the other to the south toward, toward Geba. Jonathan said to his young armor bearer, Come, let's go over to the outpost of those uncircumcised men. Perhaps the Lord will act in our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. Do all that you have in mind, his armor bearer said. Go ahead, and I am with you, I am with you, heart and soul. Jonathan said, come on then. We will cross over towards them and let them see us. If they say to us, wait there until we come to you, we will stay where we are and no go up then. But if they say, come on up to us, we will climb up because, the, uh, because that will be our sign that the Lord has given them into our hands. So both of them showed themselves to the Phil- Philistine outpost. Look, said the Philistines. The Hebrews are crawling out of the holes they were hiding in. The men of the outpost shouted to Jonathan and his armor bearer, Come up to us and we'll teach you a lesson. So Jonathan said to his armor bearer, Climb up after me. The Lord has given them into the hands of Israel. 
Jonathan climbed up using his hand and feet with his armor bearer right behind him. The Philistines fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer followed and killed behind him. In that first attack, Jonathan and his armor bearer killed some 20 men in an area of about half of an acre. The panic struck the whole army. Those in the camp and field and those into the outpost and raiding parties and the ground shook. It was a panic sent by God. Look again at verse 6. Then Jonathan said to the young man who bore his armor, Come, let us go over to the garrison of this uncircumcised. It might be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. What is this verse, Bible verse telling me is the fact that we don't know everything all the time. Right? Jonathan was not, let's go because God will going to deliver us. He was, let's go, maybe God will going to deliver us. What I'm trying to say, and I don't have that much time, so I'll skip forward, is that sometimes we are waiting until the Lord is telling us to go, and then we start doing something. Actually, we are not just waiting until God tells us to, to go. We are waiting until God kicks us in the back, forces us to go. Because we feel weak, we feel few, we feel powerless, we, we have all kinds of reasons, all the reasons in the world. But also we have the main reason to go, and that reason is that God is with us. And if He is with us, who can be against us? 2004, I came to the United States. I was a pastor in Romania since 96 to 2004. I was in the ministry. God was blessing. I think the last five years of ministry, I, by the grace of God, I baptized 60 people or something like that. It was, it was amazing, God working. God work. I'm not taking any credit of it. I'm just mentioning how God was using. 2004, some disappointments. I said, let's go to the United States. I talked to God and I said, Lord, if it's your will, make it this way. And God made it that way. And I came to the United States with my entire family, decided not to go back into the ministry. I said, okay, I'll do whatever I can. I got involved in the church. I was, a, I was, a, I was an elder, not an elder. I was involved in the church, but not direct ministry. I said, okay. But 2008 came... And God was kind of trying to talk to me. And he said, Daniel, I want you back. And I said, Lord, but I don't want to go back. But I want you back. And I was like, okay, if you want me back, I need to do something. I tried. I sent resumes around the United States. Uh, I received the response back from only one conference, Oregon. And they said, your... A resume came like this, and it was X, Y, one, two, three, Y, I, I, you know, only letters and uh, letters and numbers. I don't know what happened. You know, my laptop probably switched everything and made it coded. But by the way, the response that position is not available anymore. So. I was like, what we are going to do, Lord, because you want me to. So I was impressed to move back to Romania. Not easy. And we moved back to Romania, considering, saying, Lord, I want to do, I'm moving back to work for you, not for, for anything else. That period, by the way, when I was doing construction here in the United States, I think was financially was the best period of my life, you know, financial-wise, because... Uh, doing construction, I think it's paying if you know what you're doing. 
But I went back to Romania, and when I got there, I said, I mean, I, I left with the idea that I want to do something for the Lord, right? That was the main reason I went there. And I said, Lord, I'm here. I want to do something for you. Show me what. And the month passed, nothing happened. I had some contacts when I left here. They, somebody from the union, come, when you, when you come there, come talk to me. I went there and probably forgot completely that he talked to me and said, ask me to go pass by. And I'm not the person to say, hey, uh, you promised. No, if you don't remember, bye. That's not nothing to say. I had something else I tried, didn't work. And then I'm like, two months passed. No money, right? Back in Romania. I started to work. And I picked immediately construction, renovation. I renovated an entire apartment, complete transformation. Complete transformation. But I was like, Lord, what am I going to do? I moved from the States in the Romania for the ministry, and I'm still doing construction. What's wrong? What's wrong with me? And then it clicked. I went to a nearby church where I was living. I was talking with, I was friend, I met them playing soccer with the head elder and another elder in that church. And while playing soccer, I was like, can I talk to you? Yeah. Can I, can, do you agree for me to come to do an evangelistic series in your church? Let's talk with your pastor, but would you support that idea? And they said, yeah, sure, let's do it. We talked with the pastor, the pastor agreed. And we did the evangelistic meetings, 14 nights. God was blessing, health message, evangelism, people about in a, in a church, like 25 people, there were about 100 visitors every night. So it was a real blessing for me, for the church and for me also. What I'm trying to say is, from that moment on, God put everything in order. And it followed such beautifully. I got hired by the conference again. <laughs> you don't argue with the Lord when he... And I, I, sh I shouldn't say this because it's recorded. I didn't even place the request. A friend of mine came to me and he said, Do you want to get hired? I said, No. Do you want to get hired? Please place a request. I said, if you place a request and sign it for me and they accept it, I will say yes. And that happened. I probably shouldn't say that. But from that moment, everything fall into place. When? While sit sitting under a pomegranate tree, Wondering, Lord, I'm here. I want to give my life to you. I want to work for you forever. Lord, I promise. Why? Why are you not showing your way? God did not, does not work that way. And I'm pretty much sure that a lot of us are like that. Waiting for the Lord to show the way. Jonathan is not that kind of person. Jonathan, it's stepping without knowing for sure what God will going to do for him. But because he is faithful to the Lord, he is hoping that the Lord will follow him. Actually, not follow him, but the Lord has prepared a way for him. He is hoping for that. And when he engages, he is victorious because he is stepping in faith, not in assurance. Yes, we like when everything is set up to step in and say, yes, Lord is good. But where is our faith? What about when we don't know anything? And this guy here, Jonathan, doesn't know. And he is not taking part of, <coughs> excuse me, part of 600 people that are with his father. He is not taking, he is not basing his faith on the people behind him. He is facing his faith only on the Lord because he is stepping in faith with the Lord in his armor bearer. And by the way, guys, brothers and sisters, the armor bearer, man, to follow Jonathan without a weapon, isn't that suicidal? But he is following. 
because he sees leadership in Jonathan. He sees faith in Jonathan. And he is following even if you're going to go to death. He is following. Isn't that beautiful how God is working? How God is working? Jonathan and his, side, uh, and his arm bearer, they don't know for sure. They live in a dimension of divine uncertainty. But it doesn't paralyze them in the process. Divine uncertainty. Do we know what that is? Is that, and I think we need to come to that. Is that moment when we are, one, God, what do you want me to do next? What's the next step, Lord? And we are not figuring it up for the Lord and presenting the plan before him and saying, Lord, bless this plan. But he's asking, Lord, and God is talking with us every day and he's saying, this step and this step. And even we don't know. We just step forward because God is ahead of us. One more thing. I am shrinking it a lot. Do you know what happened under the pomegranate tree? Saul is not just sitting there drinking the juice or eating the fruit. He want to make sure that people remembers him that he is a good servant of the Lord. You don't know how? He passes a law that will, will going to show him extremely religious. You're going to get all the appreciation of the entire nation. You know what the law is? Nobody will going to eat until we gain the victory. A fasting, right? When you talk about fasting, we are religious, right? Isn't that, the, you know, the act of self-denying to not eat and to dedicate to the Lord? This is what he's doing there. He wanted to show that he is religious. But you know what he did before? He disobeyed God. Chapter 13. Read the beginning of the chapter 13. He disobeyed God and he, he brought the, the offering before the Lord. And he was, that was forbidden. No touch, no touch. But now he, he want to counterbalance. And he is making religious act for people to, to, to see that and to follow him while others are taking the fight. And when those are, don't know about the rule because Jonathan doesn't know about the rule and he eats from the honey that he found in the forest when he, he want to kill them in the name of religion. Praise God. God did not allow it. The people did not allow it. But you see how easy it is sometimes to place those that are doing the work as being disobedient to your rules and wish them to die. Because they are disturbing your authority and they are disturbing your way of doing things. They are showing that you are weak because Saul was weak. That's why he was sitting under the pomegranate tree. That's why. And he was trying to compensate his weakness with some rules that were going to make him look good. Praise God for Jonathan. He chose not the easy way. Okay, there are two people. One with, one with a sword. The other one, I don't know what he was doing there, you know. <laughs> Probably encouraging him. And instead of saying, come, come down here to us. Right? That would be the easy way. Come here. And when the, a Philistine approaches, it's a, there are cliffs, right? It's a difficult terrain there. He was going to uh, ki uh, cut their feet, right? Can you fight without feet? No, you cannot. But he says, 
we're going to go up. We're going to go up. That's the heavy part, the heavy side. And when he goes there, God is delivering because he already prepared that deliverance for the people of Israel. They just needed to grab it, to have faith and go and have it. There are people around us that are prepared for the gospel. Don't feel weak. Don't feel out number. Because the God Almighty is in front of us. And he's going to lead us. Lord, we are thankful. And we want to give our hearts to you. Please lead us. Guide us. And give us the courage, Lord. And help us to remember. Help us to remember that you are ahead of us and we have nothing to fear. I am praying for my brothers and sisters here. In Jesus' name, amen.